Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mercatus Podcast, Digital Grocer, episode 36, the end of season three. I'm your host, Sylvain Perrier, president and CEO of Mercatus Technologies, and connected with me in my home studio from the safety of his bunker, I guess I would say his bat lair is Mark Fairhurst, vice president of marketing. Mark, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure as usual. I've got an upgrade I went from a bunker to a bat cave. <laughs> You did upgrade. You got some new equipment. True. true. You're uh, utilizing that old love seat I see in the corner. Yeah, that thing's like circa 1987. Oh, God. The memories in that love seat. <laughs> Teenage memories uh, won't see the light of day. Well, good. Have you checked for a spare change? <laughs> no? Of course. No. Okay, good. Well, you know, that's, you know, you never know, right? So, Mark, you know, during the last week in the U.S., we're facing, you know, something appalling and disgusting. And it's uh, it's not COVID-19. It's the unfortunate death of George Floyd at the hands of a corrupt police officer. And I got to tell you, that incident has prompted tremendous outrage across the country. And thousands, if not millions, have taken to the streets. And quite frankly, not in Minneapolis. You and I were talking about this on Friday and Saturday, but it's across the U.S., you know, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, L.A., and it's not only in the U.S., it's in Canada. I mean, we had protests in Montreal, even Halifax, Nova Scotia, Vancouver, and Toronto, and many of the protests have been, you know, to a certain extent, peaceful. Now, some have turned violent with police clashes, burning buildings, looting, I think targets bearing the brunt in Minneapolis, I got to tell you. And one of the things that was really scary on Saturday night, it must have been around 10 o'clock Eastern, I was watching, you know, I tend to jump between BBC, CNN, Fox. I try to get mm-hmm. all the outlets. I don't necessarily prescribe only to one, and it was going over on Vice Media. And they were showing something that really, that really freaked me out. There was a shop owner in, in uh, the West End of Dallas, and it's predominantly a black community. And he was running with a machete in his hands towards one, his shop to try to protect it. Now, I wouldn't recommend running with a machete in your in your hands. I quite frankly would recommend anyone running with scissors in their hands. But this gentleman in question, they started pelting him with rocks. They hit him in the back of the head with a skateboard, and he just went down. That's and terrible. they were kicking him, and that's like... I mean, the level of violence, I'm not talking about somebody taking spray paint and tagging the side of a building or doing anything like that. I'm literally trying to kill someone, you know, and these protests have been, you know, focused on policing and 2020 has been brutal and especially painful for uh, a lot of the, uh, the minorities in the U.S. and in Canada and just the, the whole economical turmoil that's been brought on by the staying at home has hit these minorities because the reality is they weren't financially stable going into the pandemic and the angst and the fear of dying and you're stuck Mm -hmm. in and you see the violence that's being caused. It's just, it's a powder keg. It just, it just blew up. And, you know, systematic racism is a problem in our country. It's not only in the U S it is here in Canada. We see it here with the Asian minorities. We see it with the people from the islands Yep. And it needs to stop, and we need to change this as a collective. We can't just depend on our governments to do something about it. It starts in our homes. It starts in our communities. Absolutely. You know, And, and the points you raise, it's um, something I was reading this morning, just doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's a gradual process that society gets to this point. Mm-hmm. And, but it just seems in the last three, four years, it's just become ever so more heightened that, you know, it just takes a trigger event like the unfortunate death of George Floyd to spark the anger that's been building for many years. Yeah. And we could just, you know, if it's not George Floyd, it's Trayvon, it's it's someone else. We just, you know, Mm -hmm. And if it's, you know, I can go on a bit this because if it's not them, it's someone else. And if it's not that, it's a school shooting. At one point, you know, what's the saying? Repetition is the definition of insanity. You know, you're getting the same result. Like, come on, guys. Yeah. 
No, so while all this is happening, the country is still dealing with a pandemic. And, you know, things are slowly starting to open, but it's clear COVID-19 is going to have a lasting impact on retail. You know, for a brief period on May 6, we saw Shopify become Canada's most valuable company, surpassing yep. the Royal Bank of Canada. Now, yep. shares on the TSX market, what was it, over $1,000 Canadian? Yep. Is crazy. And you know, the, and the mantra that they have at Shopify is to help the SMBs survive what they like to call the new normal. And on May 19th, they had an, an explosive announcement. They actually announced a deal with Facebook and launched Facebook Shops. Yeah. We, we had actually talked about this. And I think, our, was it our first or second episode of the Digital Grocery? Yeah, we talked about that with, I think our guest at the time was Britton Ladd. And, you know, we right. were w- waxing philosophically to the question of, well, could Facebook eventually become, quote unquote, this portal to e-commerce? And, you know, fast forward, I think that episode was recorded in what, 2018, maybe yep. early, yeah, early, yep. mid 2018? Spring, spring of 2018, I believe. Yeah, spring of 2018 and fast forward. And now what we're seeing is the true emergence of, you know, social commerce. Now I got to think if you're at Target, you know, riots aside, in Amazon, you're going to respond to this, I would assume at some point. But now, so because of COVID-19, brick and mortar retail will no longer be the same. I got to think even more so if a second wave is going to hit. You know, what I mean by this is that I'm talking about size, the rapid commoditization of products and where people are just going in to purchase these products, the idea of assortment, the layout of the stores, in the whole queuing process. I don't know, Mark, I know that you and I enjoy uh, a fine red wine, but I'm already starting to see this at the LCBO. For people who don't know what the LCBO is, it's the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. It's actually the largest purchaser of spirits in the world. Mm-hmm. You queue outside, they've made changes to the layout of the store and to the planogram process. You go in, you buy, and you pay and you leave. It's become extremely frictionless to a certain extent, which is kind of interesting. And I think the retailers that are going to win in this new normal are the ones that have historically invested planogram management, queue busting. I think they'll come out on top. But I think what's really going to change is consumer uh, psyche. Now, I'm a destination shopper. What does that mean is, you know the brands that I like, I know where to buy them. If it's not online, I go straight to the store. I'm in, I'm out. Are you the same, Mark? I used to be. And of late, I've shifted all of my purchases to online. I never liked going to the mall or to uh, retail brick and mortar to begin with. Right. Uh, But I I was very much. I, I knew exactly what I was getting. I went in, got it, got out fast. And where's your share of wallet gone to now? on apparel i'm trying new brands so mm-hmm. it's a good it's a good time to if you're a brand that's looking to clean up and get other consumers right. i think now is a, a good time to sort of disintermediate that relationship with the more established brands the only brick and mortar that i still visit is grocery right what about home depot home depot i purchased my barbecue online uh, you did. normally i would have gone in to look at the various models right but it was a great experience. And, and so you I did got, click and collect? I ordered it and Sunday night, got it Monday morning. Oh, good for you. I mean, uh, I just recently tried their click and collect solution. And, it's, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm rebuilding a fence and it's been two weeks now. I'm still waiting for my items to give me the thumbs up to go really? pick them up. I, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with their unfortunate volume of transactions they're getting and the staffing and so on. But, you know, the reality is when you think of the pandemic, Retailers that rely on the exploration aspect of people coming into their stores, if they're not reinventing themselves, it's going to be a challenge. And and there's one retailer that that whole idea of exploration, especially for apparel, that they're not really good at is Amazon. Mm -hmm. And Steve Dennis talks about this in his book, Remarkable Retail. And we had Steve on on a show, I think two or three episodes ago. You know, Amazon has made buying easy and has put convenience at the top of their list. And unfortunately, that's sacrificed the idea of shopping and browsing. 
And this is true when you try to buy a t-shirt, a uh, dress shirt. I tried to buy, get this, deck shoes and swimming trunks. I mean, I say swimming trunks. I feel like I'm my grandfather and this is like 1920. <laughs> <laughs> swimming trunks. It's like a big one piece. Not really, but I just wanted to buy because it's more comfortable because we it got over 90 degrees yeah. north of Toronto and, you know, you just want to be comfortable when you go outside. But it, it wasn't a great experience to try to buy it on Amazon. Now, there's some rumors swirling in the market. I want to set the stage because I think this is really interesting. So in early May, JCPenney filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now, this wasn't a surprise. It's covered in Steve's book. And you kind of get a sense of it because Sean Gansh, the former chief customer officer, uh, departed in February. And, and, you know, most people would know Sean from his days as CMO over at Sprouts Farmer's Market. Now, the, the pandemic, unfortunately, put that last nail in the coffin for JCPenney. And they're in a virtual race culminating sometime in mid to end of July to try to raise capital to try to restructure. Now, so what's at value at JCPenney is their real estate holdings. I think they have something like 846 locations. They own roughly 387 of them, and the remaining are all leased. But the pandemic is not helping the value of their real estate portfolio. So the longer they stay closed, it's actually just going to drag down the value of that portfolio. They closed, I think, close to 30%. And they have $4 billion in debt to restructure, (laughs) which is insane. And so the big rumor is that Amazon has boots on the ground in Plano, Texas, at JCPenney's office. And they're interested in acquiring the organization. You think they're going to cherry pick certain locations? So I'm not sure if it's in the world of Amazon, if the prospect of buying a real estate portfolio that has X amount of value and five distribution centers, although I think JCPenney actually does not own their distribution centers. They may be actually owned. uh, They may be just leased. I think what they're trying to get is to become more fashion forward. Mm-hmm. And their CEO, the CEO of JCPenney, she built out an amazing team. They actually have a bit of a cult following for some of the brands that they own on the private label side. And I think bringing that knowledge into Amazon would be a greater value and convert JCPenney to 100% online and just jettison the portfolio whatsoever. Interesting. So I don't know. I I think if you're Amazon, the one thing they've not conquered is the soft lines. And I think this may be the way to do it. I mean, wasn't it last night you and I talked about why not Neiman Marcus? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I think it was Scott Galloway that raised that, that idea. Yeah. I'm not sure if Neiman Marcus would fit into the whole Amazon portfolio. It's a fairly high end brand. Yeah. The only, I think the notion was that because, it is high end that it would be a niche play for prime, but mm. maybe uh, too niche of a, of a play for prime. Too, too, too rich, maybe. too rich. I think, I don't know. I don't know. You know, he may be right. And maybe, maybe Walmart should be acquiring JC Penny, the private label brands and blending into the whole, the whole George private label yep. solution. But anyways, we're going to see how this plays out. You know, now it goes without saying we've talked about, a lot of things and to one extent this pandemic has had a tremendous impact in the grocery retail industry especially with the surge in online sales not only with the Mercatus customers but industry-wide because of our podcast because of a lot of the research that we do and the friends that we have in the space we get a lot of data coming in from multiple points mm-hmm. Now, and to lend credence to this topic and to remove any potential anecdotal elements, we decided to ask David Bishop, partner at Brick Meets Click, to discuss a research piece that he recently published. Now, for those of you who might not know the organization, the company was founded in 2011 and is essentially a collection of some really smart people that leverage their extensive expertise in the grocery business analytics, and, and they have this demonstrated sense of what's next, and they help food retailers and marketers meet the challenge of new competition and navigate these profound changes that we're seeing from the results of disruption. Now, joining us on the phone from the U.S., hopefully from the safety of his own, 
is David Bishop, partner at Brick Meets Click. And as a partner, David manages the research and retailer benchmarking programs. He has deep knowledge, the convenience and grocery classes of trade across both digital and physical sales. In addition to his role at the organization, he's actually the managing partner at Balvor, a firm that specializes in convenience retail and provides category management, trade marketing, analytic services to numerous organizations. He has a BA in organizational communications and marketing from the University of Iowa. David, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So can you share with us the survey methodology? Sure. So we've been looking at essentially stepping back brick meets click really operates under a very simple principle, and that is understanding how technology is enhancing the way we shop and specifically for groceries. So around 2011, we started doing that primarily uh, with retail clients, and it was really around the communications tools that retailers were using to build those relationships, whether it was social, text, web, you know, most of the digital tools. It was in 2016, roughly, that we moved over to looking at commerce or what we kind of more generally refer to as online. And as we do that, there's a combination of tools that we use, but relative to the research we just published, we utilize an online survey panel of households in the U.S., talk to the primary shoppers who do the grocery shopping for their house. We look at their total spend in aggregate, as well as the portion that may go online if they do shop online. And then we dig into that relative to purchase recency to understand their habits. We look more closely at the past 30 days in terms of where they bought online, how much they've spent online, and how many times they've shopped with those providers online. And then we dig even deeper into the most recent experience to look at the uh, satisfaction and the likelihood to repeat. We use all that information for a variety of purposes, size the market, inform our uh, market forecast models and to provide guidance to the industry. And David, can you give me a sense of sample size? Sure, right now we're running between 1,600 and 1,700 respondents to the monthly survey. And that's geographically spread across the US? Geographically represented and weighted based on age. Perfect, now this number blew me away. So online grocery growth continued across the pandemic reaching 6.6 billion US dollars for the month of May alone. So what was the average spend? The average spend according to that work was $90. Just so that we put that in reference, that average spend is reflection of both or of especially in conventional grocers. Mm -hmm. So Whole Foods would be included. It would also include our mass discounters, so Target and Walmart, and specifically in only the portion related to grocery-related products. And then also it would include our pure play online grocery delivery providers, folks like Fresh Direct. So we, you know, there's always these numbers that are published out there. And I think the one that I, that I always quote the most is the one that was sent out by, I think it was FMI, saying that 2025, we're going to hit $100 billion in online grocery sales. We must be on our way to hitting that number sooner and faster. Is that your sense? Well, I would say obviously that's still an aggressive number and would I like us to hit 100 million uh, sooner rather than later? I think it's a tough question to answer because if I say yes, unfortunately I'm going to be rooting for some of the the crisis that got us to where we are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I'd rather see is a stabilization and a return to something we would call as the new normal. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Now, if we compare the main numbers to the previous month, what were the online sales for April? So the online sales for April were 5.3 billion. So we had essentially a month over month increase of, you know, 24, 25%. So, you know, in normal times, that would be impressive. What we would have typically seen on a year over year basis in 2019, if we looked at 2018 versus 2019, we'd see that type of rate on an annualized basis, uh, whether we're looking at orders or dollar sales. To see it on a month over month basis is, is also unprecedented. And what was the increase for the average spend from April to May, or was there an increase? Yeah, it increased, I think, about 6 or 7%, mm -hmm. um, a healthy increase of about $5. So we would have seen a, 
uh, average uh, order value of 85 in April and then ended up at 90 for May. So we continue to see people adding items to their cart. It's also a reflection of the fact that we did have rapid price inflation during May Mm -hmm. uh, that's reflected in there. And it's also a reflection that improved product availability is preventing fewer lost sales for the retailer. Yeah, good point. And in household penetration rate gave me a sense. Are we talking something more than 20%? Yeah, we're at 33% according to our estimates. And that's 33% of all U.S. households. Now, keep in mind, only about 90% of U.S. households actually use the Internet. Mm-hmm. So that 33% actually accounts for that. Okay. Uh, and again, that's a roughly 43 million households in the U.S. that we would consider monthly active grocery shoppers, that is, having placed at least one order online for either delivery or pickup within the last 30 days. And any sense out of that 33%, does your research talk about how many of those are potentially exclusively using online shopping for grocery? Yeah, I think most grocers recognize that the vast majority of trips to the traditional store would have been classified as quick trips, those involving one or to five items. So it's a little unusual and unfair to look at it specifically as a percentage of share wallet. Mm -hmm. So if we looked at households who reported that they were spending during the past 30 days, 80% or more, we would be roughly at 30% of those households that were actively online. So that would translate to roughly 13% of all U.S. households were purchasing more than 80% of their grocery dollars online or products online. Yeah, that's interesting. So the one phenomenon that we noticed at Mercatus is the number of first-time users skyrocketed. Even people that had not yet signed up for any of our retailers' loyalty programs. And I think in one day, maybe for two retailers, we had over 35,000 new people create accounts and immediately enter the online shopping stream did you get a sense of that, that there's this increase came from people who are just net new to the experience? Yeah. So when we consider net new, we're looking at past 30 days, even though we can trace back when they purchased, if ever online, but of that 43 million households, over half of them would have been considered net new during past 30 day activity. So they may have been online before, let's say three, four months ago, but that most likely would have been you know, online buying for ship to home. Mm-hmm. So we would say well over half of the active customers who are shopping online today, or at least in May, would have been essentially net new if we wanted to use that terminology. Okay. And the one thing we noticed is, I can't give you a figure, but I suspect you have one is, you know, when I look at our star ratings for some of the mobile applications that we've created, the star ratings have plummeted. And when we read the comments, a lot of the comments are not having to do with the mobile app itself. It's having to do with product availability inside some of the stores, product availability available online, cleanliness of the stores, the fact of having to wait in the lineup to get a, an online slot for pickup or delivery. And so people find the closest vehicle that they can use to lodge a complaint. So our sense is that to a certain extent, satisfaction has gone down. Have you been able to measure to get a sense of that number? Yeah. So before uh, the COVID crisis, we were on an annual cadence where our last similar type of research was done in August of 2019. So we're using that as our proxy for pre-COVID, if you will. And back then, whether we were looking at the mass discounters or supermarkets, you know, the satisfactions were considerably higher. They probably would have been in the high 80s relative to intent to reuse the same service within the next 30 days. Well, as soon as we hit March, those things just fell off the table. Mm. I mean, essentially half. And a lot of people wondered why. Well, I think you hit some of the basic reasons. I mean, if we think about omni-channel strategies, which we measure in the form of a seamless shopping scorecard, if people can't shop how they want, which is I want to shop online, and they're being frozen out essentially because they can't get a slot, then that's going to have a detrimental impact on any experience. If they can't buy what they want because of rampant out of stocks, which went eight to nine times over the historical average and still is probably two to three times over it, that's going to weigh on it. And then when you can't get it when you want, you think, oh, I'll take one hour, I'll take next day, and you're finding it's four or five days or it's being canceled to your surprise, 
then that's also going to weigh on it. So when we look at those causal factors, it's pretty clear. And in looking at reviews and ratings, that customers just don't necessarily expect those type of disruptions to the way they shop. And in a, an emergency state like we are, they're not acceptable. And retailers understand that. Mm-hmm. And that's just a function of the times that we're And are you seeing a difference between preferences on fulfillment where consumers, hey, I want super frictionless, I want delivery, or, you know, quite frankly, I'm okay to pick it up. Were you able to pick up on those? Yeah. And, you know, we've been watching this pretty closely. In fact, probably at the end of 2018, and we published at the beginning of 2018, we had already seen the strong preferences for the way people want to shop online. So one of the things we pointed out early on of, of two years ago was the growth of pickup. And this was at a time when everyone was adding delivery because of how the business was growing. We saw very little crossover between households that use delivery and pickup. And that was even more amplified if we looked at a specific retailer's transactional household data. We see that overall, even across channels, although there is more overlap, but that's different. But when we get into delivery, tends to skew toward uh, older consumers or wealthier consumers. The pickup tends to skew toward the lower income households. And that has implications for what we're now dealing with. And one more reason why we believe pickup is going to see kind of a second surge from what we saw a year ago as we deal with the financial calamity that's coming out of this health crisis. Yeah, especially with the, we're seeing now the SNAP EBT program being extended to north of 38 states, where historically it was only four states. We've seen Department of Agriculture actually increase the program from close to something like $50 billion to north of $74 billion, and that's likely going to increase. The unemployment rate is north of 15%. It's pretty intense what's happening. Is it? Do you think, you know, what's the stickiness in terms of online ordering? Are these consumers that have entered the stream now for the first time, are they likely to remain, or will they readjust to something that will be the post-normal to the current normal? Yeah, I think without question, we're in a very unusual, atypical situation that isn't going to continue as is. And when some of those motivators relax, so will the online behaviors. What I'm talking about specifically there is the concern for catching coronavirus has been a very strong predictor of using online Mm -hmm. as a mode for how I shop. If we think about a binary choice, whether it's in store or online, those who are trying to practice the social distancing principles or mitigate the concerns they have, shopping online for pickup or delivery would have that appeal. It's not the only appeal. And unfortunately, the fact that now 50 million households in the U.S., according to our survey, have reported a dramatic drop in income, that is 25% or more, anyone who has a high degree of concern is going to be forced to make other choices relative to how they shop, where they shop, and what they buy, when they shop. And we're seeing all that play out both in our survey as well as other information out there. Interesting. And and the one thing that we've noticed in our research around the whole, you know, demographical spectrum is that it historically, maybe as of call it late 2019, the distribution was fairly equal across the age groups. And we had noticed that Gen X, the boomers had caught up to buying online. And I'm kind of curious, have you seen that shift during the pandemic? Well, the demographics, if we look at it from an early formation stage, have been without question the strongest age cohort. You know, life events are what drives adoption faster than the positive word of mouth, which would be the diffusion of the experience. And, you know, that would be birth of a child, uh, marriage. Mm -hmm. Generally, we're dealing with households with one or multiple incomes. I think the older consumers are catching up. And that's a function of the positive word of mouth that has been shared by friends and family that they respect and trust. Obviously, at this time, we've seen a huge uptick on the older consumers over 65 who are in a more affected and impacted class. Unfortunately, they're the least able to utilize this solution Mm -hmm. for technological reasons. And, you know, I've documented that with my own mother on that. And she's already now back in the stores after three home deliveries that she received from her preferred grocery store. 
Yeah, I like the fact that you've shared that example because it supports an experience I had. I actually sat in on a call with our help desk where they were helping an 82-year-old man put in his credit card information to buy his first online grocery order. And, you know, I went to the back of, you know, it's before we closed the office, and I had to go to the back and get some of our user interface engineers to have them listen into the call to say, hey, guys, I know we don't build websites, and I think no one really does for someone above the age of 75 to plus. And so how do we create this environment, this experience that makes it easier And maybe it's not web technology. Maybe it's not mobile technology. Maybe it's a dial-in. Maybe it's a phone call. There's got to be something easier that we can do. The funny thing about ours was I videotaped it. I wrote a blog about it, and I told her, prefaced it, that I would only intervene to prevent her from abandoning the process. So Mm -hmm. there was about eight or nine what I called speed bumps in that. But at the very end, she put in her credit card information, no problem, but then it asked for a mobile phone. And her response was, I don't have a mobile phone. And I I did respond, she does, she just never has it on. Uh And I had to put my mobile phone in. So needless to say, every time there was a update from the provider, I was receiving it and then I had to call her. But that was just the one example amongst many of what do you do if you don't have a mobile phone? And how do you actually complete that transaction? And would it cancel if it wasn't a mobile phone? I don't know the answer to that, but clearly an opportunity and a challenge for, you know, a subset of the population. Well, that's a great example. I appreciate you sharing that with us. You know, for our retailers that are listening and they're not listening to you talk about your research and its findings, are you seeing anything in there that they should be mindful of? Well, you know, I mean, natural instinct is to take care of the customer today. I mean, defending the base business is the the first need that every retailer has, even above profits. And we're seeing that today. Same thing with differentiation. But at the same time, I say that we can't, you know, miss an opportunity that comes out of this crisis to strengthen the strategies that we're developing and deploying. And this really does bring to light many issues that, you know, retailers haven't had to face as acutely as they had to today. And as it starts to alleviate it, it actually kind of mutes some of the desires for actually having to have a sound strategy, you know, because everyone's business is growing, right? No, absolutely. And so we have a webinar coming up. Can you share with the audience? Yeah. So each month we take the opportunity to present some of the, what we like to think are fresh insights in a very kind of informal format. And I believe you and I are going to be on there with Bill, who's going to be moderating it. That's going to be on Tuesday, June 16th at 1 central, 2 p.m. Eastern. And really it's designed to also provide practical guidance and perspectives from what we are seeing and hearing from the retailers. And so I think, you know, getting your perspective with your retailers would be a great add to the perspective and insights that we're gaining from both this survey as well as our work with retailers too. Absolutely. Now, David, it's been great having you on the show today. How do people get a hold of you? Easiest way, I guess, would be via email. That would be david.bishop at brickmeetsclick.com. Perfect. And Mark, it's great seeing Uh, you. You look healthy. (laughs) (laughs) That's because I boosted the saturation on the camera. Oh, and here I thought that was a tan. No, no. No. Okay. Well, that's okay. Um, How do people get a hold of us? us? Yeah. I always ask you this question. I know. I know. www.mercatus.com is our URL, our web address. All of our social channels are listed there. The podcast that we just recorded will also be there. And we'll have a handy link to register for the webinar on uh, June 16th. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. And Don't forget to download and listen to our next episode. I think we're going to have a really great kickoff to season four. We're going to be tackling more subjects that are related to the pandemic and what could be the new normal and help you guys navigate the waters of grocery e-commerce. Thank you, everyone. Peace. Peace.